Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Forget about soil health and focus instead on plant health. This discussion is about helping farmers and growers to become much more profitable by focusing on plant health and how that builds healthy soils. By focusing on plant health and how that builds healthy soils. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our Patreon community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to a new episode. I'm Kumba Sain, your host. On the podcast today, I'm joined by John Kempf, co-founder of Advancing Eco Agriculture. He and his team of over 30 people are helping growers to make more money with regenerative agriculture since 2006. And since 2006, they have served over 2 million acres all over the world. Welcome, John. Hi, thanks for having me, Kuhn. I'm excited to be here. And to start with a personal question, what got you into regenerative agriculture more than, let's do the, let's do the calculation, 13, 14 years ago? I grew up on a family fruit and vegetable farm in Northeast Ohio in the snow belt south of Lake Erie. And we were very mainstream producers. My father was the pesticide distributor for the local region. I was a licensed private pesticide applicator. And... In the early 2000s, 2002, three, and four, we had a three-year consecutive period in which we lost the majority of our crops, the four primary crops that we were growing at that point, which were tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchini, and cantaloupe. We lost greater than 70% of each of those four crops three consecutive years to a variety of different diseases and insects that we were unsuccessful in managing and treating with pesticides. In 2004, the third year of that three-year period, we began renting a a field from a neighboring farm that bordered right up against one of our own fields that had not had vegetables growing in the past. So the remaining fields we had been farming for the prior decade, they got pesticide applications every year. And on this new field had been in a dairy farm, a small grains, corn, alfalfa, hay rotation with manure applications, limestone applications. So in 2004, we began renting this neighboring field and planted a crop of cantaloupe directly across the field border. On the old soil, at harvest time, 80% of the leaves were infected with powdery mildew. And on the new soil, there was no powdery mildew, not 5% or 10% infection, but you couldn't find any. There was this knife line boundary right down to the center of the field. So I wanted to know what are the differences between these two plants and what allows one plant to be resistant to the powdery mildew when the next plant a meter away is susceptible? And you sprayed both of them or you, your management was exactly the same? Management was exactly identical. Same variety, planted the same day, same fertilizer applications, identical fungicide applications, but two completely different responses. Over the next six months, year, and still continuing to the day, I began researching and studying very intensely, trying to understand that question, is what are the differences between these two plants? And I was very fortunate to be able to connect with some leading plant pathologists and consultants and agronomists from here in North America and from around the world. And what I learned after a great deal of reading and studying and asking a lot of questions, in its simplest essence, is that plants have an immune system exactly the same way that we do. We know that each of us has our own immune system, but they don't all work equally well. Some people become ill with the first cold or flu bug that comes along and other people practically never become ill. And the only difference between those two is how well their immune system has been supported with nutrition over the course of their entire lifetime, in fact, from even before they were born. And this 
same idea holds true for plants as well, that we can provide plants with the necessary nutrition to provide such a strong immune response that they can become extremely resistant to almost all diseases and all insects. So that was really the genesis of what got me started. We started making a lot of changes on the farm that I was working on, on my parents' farm. Uh, we went completely pesticide-free in 2006, which was the same year that I founded Advancing Eco Agriculture. And our initial focus, the initial intent of our work was to help growers manage nutrition in such a manner that they could grow crops that were resistant to diseases and insects. And we were very successful in accomplishing that and are still very successful today. But as we worked with growers, I realized that not only could we produce plants that had a functional immune system and were resistant to disease and insects, but there was also the capacity to then transfer that immunity to the people who consume that food. And that we could have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. In addition to those two realizations, we also had a series of experiences when testing our system and our products on strawberries in California and on corn in Kansas and various other crops, where we realized that we were seeing very rapid gains in organic matter, much more rapid than what would typically be expected, as much as a third to a half a percentage point of organic matter gain in a growing season during the growing season while we were growing a crop. So we were actually able to observe where we were building soil organic matter while we were growing corn. Which is something that goes against all, all known knowledge, right? Well, actually, it doesn't go against all known knowledge. It goes against some recent expectations, recent in terms of the last 30 or 40 years. But actually, when you go back 50, 60 years into the research during the 60s and 70s, the common knowledge of the day by leading agronomists was that the fastest way to build soil organic matter was to grow corn. They considered corn to be able to build organic matter very rapidly because it was very efficient, one of the most efficient crops at photosynthesizing and sequestering carbon. Wow. And today we have the exact opposite perspective. Yeah. So what has changed? What has changed is the way that we manage the crop. So to go all the way back to your original question, when I began to realize that we can grow plants that can be resistant to diseases and insects and eliminate the need for pesticides, that can provide food as medicine, and that can regenerate soil health at the exact same time as we're accomplishing all these other benefits, I became very inspired by the potential of these regenerative agriculture ecosystems and my personal mission and passion is to have these regenerative agriculture ecosystems become the status quo, become the mainstream against which everything else is compared by 2040. And you started this company, Advancing Eco Agriculture. Can you describe in a nutshell, because obviously it's quite a big company uh, in this space, but also outside the space, what it is, what are your typical customers and, and where are you going? We initially started as a plant nutrition consulting company, an agronomy consulting company, working with large-scale fruit and vegetable growers. Today, in, we then shifted in 2009 through 2013. We did a lot of product research and development and then shifted to becoming a products company, largely because our consulting work was limited, had limited effectiveness in that we knew what to do. We could make recommendations what to do what the growers should apply or how they should manage. But in many cases, it was very difficult for growers to access the materials necessary. You're meaning they could make it on, they could make the products on the farm, but in many cases it was too difficult and you decided to, to start making these products and selling it. It was very difficult for many growers to access the necessary raw materials. Mm -hmm. The landscape in 2006, seven and eight was very different from what it is today. There was just a fraction of the biological and plant nutrition products, biologically friendly plant nutrition products that were available at that point as are what are available today. So we became a products company and today we, our focus is still on providing specialty plant nutrition products and biostimulants and biologicals to professional commercial growers. Most of our work is still today with large scale fruit and vegetable growers, particularly here in the US and Mexico. Pacific Northwest, California, et cetera. 
but we also are increasingly doing a lot of work with broad acre crops, corn, beans, small grains, etc. So our work, when we work with a grower and we work with a farm, we take a very systemic approach to understanding all the agronomic influences. What is the local climate? What are the local soil conditions? We do very thorough soil analysis. We look at irrigation water quality. We look at plant sap analysis. And then we work with the grower throughout the entire growing season to make recommendations for exactly what inputs he can use to produce the healthiest crops possible and the greatest economic response possible with the least amount of input. And this is something that I'm very passionate about as well. When I, when we started working with growers on the West Coast, I soon realized that it would not be enough. It was not enough to have a conversation about improving soil health. It was not enough to have a conversation about producing crops that were resistant to diseases and insects. It was not enough to have a conversation about growing food as medicine because growers didn't care. And when I say that growers didn't care, they were intrigued by the conversation. They would have liked to be able to accomplish all those things, but it sounded like a pipe dream. It sounded too good to be true. It didn't sound realistic. And I realized that, and also, not only did it sound too good to be true, but it wasn't important enough for growers who were struggling to stay in business and struggling to survive. It wasn't important enough for them. Those were not powerful motivators enough to them to get them to actually change their decisions. So our dialogue and our language with growers has completely shifted. We focus intensely on economics. I believe that if we want to change agriculture on a large scale, we simply need to we need to incentivize the result that we want to accomplish. And so our pathway has been to simply show growers how they can be more successful, be more profitable, and make more money with regenerative agriculture ecosystems than with the current practices that they're using right now. That's it. We focus on that very intensely, and all these other benefits come along the way. And how do you show that um, like with a typical customer comes to you? I understand that the economic perspective is extremely strong. I mean, if you have a discussion on input costs, if you have a discussion on margins, if you have a discussion on, on risk and variability, it's a very different discussion than we should help. We want to help you rebuild your soil. So how do you show or how do you make somebody aware of the potential of this? And this is not a pipe dream and it's not, doesn't sound too good to be true. Like the level of cost savings you can actually help or the level of uh, improved growth, et cetera. How do you make sure it's tangible? And doesn't sound like somebody is trying to sell a fairy to. You show them. You show them in their fields, not on somebody else's farm, but in their fields on their own. So you mean a pilot? You mean a, so these are long-term relationships, I imagine. We develop long-term relationships with the growers that we work with. And our intent is to typically we begin with a smaller scale trial on their operation that then expands until we're working with the entire operation over a three to five year period. And then our intent is to regenerate that farm's entire ecosystem to such a high degree that the need for inputs drops off dramatically and can perhaps even go to zero if that is the, is the management's choice. Over And that, that, of course, is a process that takes years. Sometimes it takes five to seven years, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the level of health when we first begin. But one of the stories that really has meant a lot to me is this one fruit grower that we were working with in the Pacific Northwest. When we met with him for the first time, it was about 370 acres of fruit. And when we met with him for the first time, he said, I have heard that you can help produce really large firm fruit. I don't want to have a conversation about reducing pesticides. I don't want to have a conversation about reducing fertilizer inputs. I've heard that you can help me grow the largest, firmest fruit possible. That's what I want to do. Okay, so that was the conversation that we had. Four years later, at our annual review meeting, we sat across the same table from each other, and this exact same grower said that four years ago, I told you that I have no desire to be organic. I have no desire to reduce fertilizer and fungicide inputs. But I don't have powdery mildew anymore. I don't have spider mites anymore. I don't have bacterial canker anymore. You know, if I wanted to, I could be organic. 
And this is a grower who over the prior four years has completely changed his farm's management profile. The insecticide and pesticide applications are only a fraction of what they were four years prior. He's growing cover crops in amongst his orchard and amongst his fruit trees. He's mulching his fruit trees with compost and, and mulch. The cultural management is 180 degrees different from what it had been four years prior. And so this was a mental process, a mental journey that took this grower four years. Which is even short in the process. I mean, four years is nothing in the life of a grower, but it's a huge transition. It is a huge transition. And that transition happened as a re direct result of the grower being open to observing what was was actually happening on his operation. So yes, we were able very quickly in the first year to produce larger, firmer fruit, which is what he really cared about. But then as he continued working with us 18 months in, he noticed that his powdery mildew pressure had decreased and that his bacterial pr canker pressure had completely reversed itself and was gone from some blocks that had been present. And so just very close observation and uh, wanting to do the best and just the, simply the desire to produce the best food and the best fruit possible was all that it took for this grower to completely shift his thinking. And that is true, I believe, for every grower in the world. No farmer ever says that today I want to farm using a management system that is going to degrade my soil health, that is going to leach, to, uh, that I'm going to lose topsoil to erosion and that I'm going to produce plants that are re very susceptible to diseases and insects. Nobody ever says that. And the reason they do those things and they use cultural management practice that lead to those results is simply because that is what they have been taught is normal. And that's the way that you do things. There's an entire second system, which we are now collectively referring to as regenerative agriculture that has not yet become mainstream, but that is very solidly based in horticulture and agricultural sciences that we'd simply need to spread the message of how to manage these systems differently. And what is that, what is it holding back if it's innate of a farmer? And I think you're absolutely right that he or she doesn't want to leave the land worse than when they either bought it or inherited it. I see that the same with impact investors. They want their portfolio to to go to the next generation in some cases. And of course they want to create something better than that was before. But if that's innate of farmers and there's a lot of information out there, there are a lot of case studies, beautiful movies, books, podcasts, like the, the one you're listening to now and like the one you're doing, what's holding back this regenerative revolution or almost outburst of activity that is slowly happening. But I, I if the potential is so big and the interest is in aid of farmers, what's holding that back? I think there are a few factors. There's a few that come to mind for me. One is the idea that regenerative agriculture is more expensive and less profitable. That idea needs to go out the window. Regenerative agriculture producers, invariably, when we begin working with growers, we expect yields to go up, we expect profits to go up. If that doesn't happen, we have not been successful. And it happens in the great majority of instances. And in those that it doesn't happen the first year, we take care to make that sure that it happens in following years. So regenerative agriculture producers should become and can be the low cost producers because they can have greater yields with fewer input costs than the conventional mainstream model. That's a very important idea that I think is not well understood. Not at all. Yeah. And then the second part is that Managing soil and plant ecosystems, soil and plant ecosystems are very complex and they are cycling constantly. They can be cycling in a degrading manner where soil health, soil biology doesn't have adequate food sources, doesn't have enough nutrition, so it does not release minerals for plants. Plants don't, photo, as a result of poor mineral nutrition, plants don't photosynthesize well. They produce even fewer sugars, which feeds the soil biology even less. And we have this self-perpetuating cycle that is degrading soil health and degrading plant health. And then we have the exact opposite of that, where we have plants which are photosynthesizing abundantly, producing a surplus of sugars, sending the surplus of sugars out through the root system, through root exudates to feed soil biology. Biology consumes these sugars and 
extracts minerals from the soil mineral matrix, provides them to the plants. Plants have an abundance of mineral nutrition, and their photosynthesis accelerates even more. This is also a self-perpetuating cycle that is regenerating soil and plant systems rather than degrading them. The only difference between a degenerative cycle on a farm and a regenerative cycle is the farm manager and the cultural management decisions that the farm manager makes. One of the big limiting factors, at least for many of the growers that we observe and work with here in North America, is that the understanding of the degenerative system and how that should be managed has been taught almost exclusively for 40 years or longer. It is what the growers are inherently familiar with. And so there is this entire body of knowledge that is required to begin making management changes and managing crops differently that is unfamiliar. And because agriculture is already inherently risky with climactic challenges, weather challenges, financial challenges, et cetera, et cetera, this feels like a tremendous risk to growers. And there's a tremendous risk aversion. So there's this combination of risk aversion, lack of knowledge of what is available and how things can be managed differently, and the economic misperceptions. So I think those are three, from, from my perspective and just off the top of my head, those are three significant factors that really slow down the adoption and have slowed down the adoption of regenerative agriculture in the past. And what's the one thing we could do? Um, I mean, there are many, many different things, obviously. What, what would be the, the top on your list if you could change one thing in the, in the regen, ag and food space? I usually ask the question, if you could wave a magic wand and tomorrow morning we wake up and, and John has changed something, <laughs> what would that be? <laughs> Can be anything. Yeah? If we could wave a magic wand and change one thing. This is actually, I'm, I'm going to borrow from one of the guests that I had on my own podcast, the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, which for those of you listening, the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast is for professional agronomists and growers. Its intent is to share the information about regenerative agriculture ecosystems and make them widely available. I will definitely link the podcast below in the show notes and the description because it's extremely interesting to listen to, to all of the guests John had. Thank you. So I had one guest who I, I asked a similar question and uh, Gary Zimmer. Um, and I asked this question of others as well. And Gary gave me an answer that I've thought a great deal about. And I'm going to choose his answer because I think it is perhaps one of the more influential levers. If I could have a magic wand and make and make one change in our agriculture ecosystems, I would eliminate the ability to apply synthetic nitrogen. Because if you can no longer apply nitrogen to a grower's crops, then that means one is he's going to need to produce that nitrogen and grow that nitrogen on his own, which means that he will have to do cover crops and crop rotations and really work with soil biology. All of a sudden, soil, the only other mechanism, the only other means to supply nitrogen is to have very aggressive and very vigorous soil microbial populations. So that would immediately shift the focus from synthetic inputs to working with soil biology. And then there would be quite a range of additional benefits, which would include that when you remove the applications of synthetic nitrogen, your disease and insect susceptibility goes down substantially. Now, this to agronomists and growers would sound quite heretical to say that we shouldn't apply synthetic nitrogen anymore. First of all, it is possible because there are many growers who are doing it successfully to supply 100% of a crop's nitrogen requirements through biological means. And so there are many who would say that, oh, if you want to eliminate nitrogen, you would cause a food crisis and a global food shortage because there wouldn't be enough production. Well, if that were to happen overnight, then perhaps yes. But we have, we have all the knowledge, we have all the information that we need today to deploy these regenerative agriculture ecosystems on scale. We don't need any new research. We don't need any new information. There certainly are things that it would be valuable to know and understand better. But if we simply applied what we already know, what has already been demonstrated to work and to be successful, we could implement these regenerative agriculture ecosystems globally. 
I think it's an amazing answer. And for sure, the first time somebody mentioned that on this podcast to change a bit the focus, what excites you at the moment in terms of your very thriving business? You mentioned you go into row cropping. Well, what is the, um, the exciting part at the moment for you in terms of regenerative agriculture in the space you are active in? My goodness, there's so much happening so fast that uh, it's hard to isolate one thing. But I would say that if there is one thing that I'm really excited about, we have been testing a, a new product that I personally have been involved in the development process over the last couple of years that is a microbial inoculant that seems to be very effective at remediating pesticides in the soil profile, including glyphosate, including AMPA, including many very difficult to degrade pesticides in the soil profile. And when we apply this inoculant, we are observing that plants which have been stunted, such as tree fruit that has been an orchard that has been sprayed with a lot of pesticides for the last several decades, all of us that are not doing well, all of a sudden these trees begin growing very rapidly. There's a lot of growth energy and they become very healthy. And in addition to that, we're getting very good fruit quality where fruit stores better. We had uh, one application on spinach where the spinach remained fresh in the refrigerator five times longer than the untreated control. And we're also getting a very strong nitrogen and phosphorus release response, which is to us an indicator that we have really accelerated the microbial population of the soil profile. All of these effects and all of these results are happening within weeks of application, not months or years. And so I'm, uh, it's still early days. The, uh, we haven't launched the product formally yet, and uh, it doesn't even have a name at this point, but we're very excited about the results that we're observing. Yeah, it sounds very, very interesting. And I'll definitely check in when it's on the market and, and when it's being, being spread. And in terms of the finance side, I mean, you mentioned it before, the profitability or the reduced cost. So the increase of profitability is, is one of the big pools of people to get in. I heard somebody say farmers get in for the premiums and stay for the cost savings. Maybe it's the other way around, but at least the two are, are very interesting. What do you see in terms of impact investors or so people that are trying to put their money to work uh, that are hopefully listening to this show? What do you see as the role of transition finance or from outside finance to help more farmers to become more regenerative or to help the regenerative agriculture as a whole? Well, having observed agricultural investments and thought about this for quite some time, it seems to me that the investment opportunity lies in a nexus of three different points. One is having exceptional farm managers. I actually put together a podcast episode on this. We had a webinar on it as well. What we have done over the last 13 some years of our consulting work is every year at the end of the growing season, we would evaluate the results of the growers that we were working with and score them on a scale of one to 10, just based on our own assessment, not on the growers assessment, because some of the most successful growers are never satisfied with their results and uh, others who are perhaps less successful are very comfortable where they are. So, and then we would group the nines and tens together. We would group the ones and twos together and we would ask a lot of questions such as uh, what are the similarities between these two groups? What are the big differences between the two groups? What are the big similarities within each of the groups? And we learned a lot about agronomy and working with plants by doing this every year, year after year after year. But we also learned that the single biggest factor to success for a farming operation in general, not just regenerative farming in particular, is the farm manager. There is a group of farm managers who are consistently exceptionally successful, even when they experience the exact same challenges that neighboring farms do. There's a group of farm managers that always does very, very well. And this group of farm managers shares a number of characteristics and, and, um, and the way that they approach management that we've identified. And, and I shared some of those thoughts in the webinar and the podcast episode. So having exceptional management is, I think, one of the most important ingredients for success. Second is developing 
a growing enterprise, a farm enterprise that is climate resilient for the crops that you're growing in the environment that you're in. For some operations, that means irrigation. For some, it might mean high tunnels. For some, it might mean hail nets, et cetera. The best crop insurance is not needing crop insurance. And so developing an operation that is very climate resilient, I think is going to become increasingly important. And then the third is an element that I believe it has not been discussed or widely appreciated at all, and that is understanding the crops which have an untapped genetic potential for increased yields. So when we think about the genetic yield potential of different crops, it's obvious that some crops we have come closer to harvesting a much higher level of their yield potential than, than others. For example, if we think about producing corn or soybeans, when we look at the discrepancies and the variability between world record yields and average yields, we can see that we're harvesting 20 to 25 percent of what these crops are genetically capable of. So there is still substantial upward room for improvement, but the current growing practices have already come close to maxing out what we can achieve in our typical climates. Then there is another group of crops, uh, and I think this my personal experience in the fruit and vegetable world is really influencing my thoughts here and what I've observed. But when we look at fruit and vegetable crops, we see that there are some crops which have been highly developed. If we take strawberries, for example, 20 years ago, strawberry crop in California, the average yield was 4,000 flats per acre. Today, 20 years later, it's 10,000 flats per acre. So over the last 20 years, the strawberry crop average yields have increased by 250% or two and a half times. If we look at producing spinach or kale or celery, there is a finite number of plants per acre that we can put in. And so it's going to be very difficult to get substantial yield increases. So these are crops that I would refer to as being highly developed. So when you have a highly developed strawberry crop or spinach or tomatoes or something like that, you're producing much higher yield than what the historical yields have been as a result of intense study and research over the last few decades. And then there is a group of crops that have not yet been highly developed that hold tremendous untapped yield potential that can best be tapped into using regenerative agriculture management practices. For example, this type of yield curve that we've observed on strawberries has not happened on stone fruit. It has not happened on citrus and some specific citrus, such as lemons. So we see that there are some growers who regularly, routinely produce lemon yields that are three times greater than the average with not a particular great deal of effort. So that is an undeveloped crop that we can have a much greater impact on. The same is true of stone fruits, such as peaches or nectarines or plums. We see again that there are growers who consistently produce yields 60 to 80 percent higher than the mainstream. So in these undeveloped crops, crops that haven't had the same degree of development focus, there is a tremendous potential because in many cases, the reason the yield increase has not expanded to the entire industry is because these crops are bio, what I would refer to as biologically sensitive in order to produce these higher yields, in order to produce this additional level of plant health, they need to be managed differently than the mainstream system is currently managing them. They need to have good biology in the rhizosphere. And as a result, so I think the, the long way around to answering your question, the, the big opportunity that I see in regenerative agriculture ecosystems is by focusing on crops which have not yet been highly developed, which have a tremendous amount of untapped upside, being managed by exceptional managers who will consistently do well in ecosystems that have been developed to be very climate resilient. And you're talking about yield here. What do you see in nutrient density, which is starting to be a buzzword everywhere, and I'm, I'm using it obviously myself as well. What do you see in terms of food as medicine you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast? What do you see happening there? I do believe that when we look at the public health challenges that exist here in North America and also in other developed countries around the world, but particularly here in North America, there is a combination of both 
a food manufacturing problem in that we have many ingredients and food manufacturing processes which are inherently very unhealthy. And then we also had agricultural productive practices and tools being used, products being used, which are also extremely unhealthy. And so I do believe that agriculture has a significant impact on public health and that producing food as medicine is certainly an objective that we should pursue on a very large scale. The question is, will growers and farmers ever be compensated for that? Can they be compensated for that? Should they be? I believe they can be and should be, but that is something that may take a very long time to come about and may never happen fully. If we look at the organic supply chain, for example, some people consider organics to be relatively successful, others less so. But if we look at organic agriculture having had a presence now for several decades, it's still a very small fraction of the supply chain. It would not be my desire to have nutrient-dense foods represent a similarly small proportion of the supply chain. I want it to be in the total supply chain, everything across the board. And so to accomplish that, I think it is not necessarily so important to have growers be compensated for producing nutrient-dense foods as it is to make the production of nutrient-dense foods an inherent result of the agricultural models that we use. I agree and I see the potential key of healthcare, but I also see the numbers that go down basically every year of the amount of the percentage of our income that we spend on food, we meaning the global population. So it, it's going to be very tricky that the payment part is going to be extremely difficult unless, I mean, we come up with whole different systems around that. Well, what I am proposing is coming up with whole different systems around production. When we work with a stone fruit producer who's producing peaches and nectarines and plums in California, he will, we've already observed this successfully, where we will see anywhere from a 20 to 40% yield increase within the first 12 to 18 months after we begin product applications and different management systems. So that points to a significant increase in profitability. The farmer immediately begins scaling it onto his entire operation. And so the, the motivation is coming from increased profitability. But the result is that not only does he have firmer fruit and larger fruit and a greater percentage of marketable fruit, but his fruit also has a greater nutrient content, also has a higher nutrient density. That's a result. So I, I really think that um, so when, we, when we think about what is the purpose of having a business, what's the purpose of being an entrepreneur? The purpose of a business is not to make money. That's the result. We need to have a mission and a vision that we're seeking to accomplish. And when we, this is the way that I think about advancing eco-agriculture, a business is really an engine to drive change. That is what a business should be in the way that it should be thought about. So our business at Advancing Eco-Agriculture is really an engine to drive change in the agriculture supply chain and the food supply chain. Simply when we begin working with a grower, then we have the result, the outcome that we regenerate soil health, we rapidly build organic matter, we sequester carbon, we produce foods that are very nutrient dense that over time can become so nutrient dense that they can be considered food as medicine and we increase a farmer's profitability. So we increase our profitability as a company, and that is a result. And the increased profitability of the grower is also a result. So I think it is a, if we really want to achieve it on scale, that needs to be a secondary outcome rather than the targeted outcome. And if you look at row cropping, I mean, you, you mentioned you entered that space, you're coming mainly from the, the growing of fruit and vegetables. Has it been very different? Has it been difficult as the scale and margins are very different, but the scale is also very different? How has been that experience and, and what, what's happening in that space with you? We've been very successful in this space as well. It is, it is more challenging because of, particularly here in North America, because of the commodity landscape that in, exists with crop insurance, et cetera, et cetera. It is difficult to show the increases in profitability, particularly over the last few years when many growers have booked a loss for their crop before they even planted seeds in the ground. So that's 
that's a more challenging conversation to have. With that being said, we have still been able to show some increases, very nice increases, in fact, because today, not historically, uh, up until very recently, in fact, commodity crops were purely priced on volume, tons and bushels, etc. And today, that has begun to shift in the last three to five years where uh, growers are increasingly compensated for protein content in the case of wheat, for oil content in the case of soybeans, for moisture content in the case of corn. So there have been quality parameters that are being added. Actually, protein content is also now being added to corn as well, where we can help growers produce higher quality grain, and that results can result in substantial increases in profitability as well. And again, that is much easier and much more straightforward to accomplish with the knowledge that we have about regenerative farming systems than it is with the mainstream. You asked this question to Gabe Brown, actually, in an earlier interview. What do you believe, and I'm going to use this question because I think it's very strong, what do you believe that is true? And he, you said about modern agriculture that others don't believe, but I would like to ask this one. What do you believe that is true about regenerative agriculture that others don't believe to be true? What I believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that is different from what many other people think about is what the engine of change actually is. There is this idea, particularly within the domain of organic and biological and regenerative agriculture, that it takes healthy soil to grow healthy plants. And if you want to produce a disease and insect resistant crop, as I've been talking about, then you need to begin by focusing on soil health. I believe this is in fact completely inaccurate. It is not healthy soil that produces healthy plants. It is healthy plants which create healthy soil. If you consider soil in the absence of plants, then it is essentially decomposed rock. But it is, in fact, plants which, through the process of photosynthesis, carbon sequestration, producing sugars, transmit these sugars out through the roots as root exudates to feed soil biology that contribute organic matter and that create what we consider to be healthy soil. So the foundational idea behind this is the realization that what we have come to accept as normal and as common is plants which are photosynthesizing only about 15 to 20 percent of their inherent photosynthetic and genetic capacity, that it is possible to manage nutrition by using foliar applications of specific nutrients and by using biologicals to, in effect, hack the system where we can increase the photosynthesis of a given plant or given crop from, let's say, 20 percent up to 80 percent, which means that we quadruple the volume of sugars being produced in every 24-hour photo period. But that quadrupling of sugars isn't necessarily going to contribute to quadrupling the yield. You might get a 20% or a 40% yield response, but you won't likely get a 4x yield response. So all of the additional sugars that are produced from this spike in photosynthesis are sent out through the root systems as root exudates to feed soil biology. This is how we can build soil organic matter by a third to a half a percentage point per year while we are growing a crop, we can do this on strawberries in California where we have the soil is tilled with a rototiller every year. It's covered in plastic mulch. It's fumigated. There are no cover crops. There is a long list of sins committed against soil health and strawberry production and in some of these fruit and vegetable ecosystems. And yet we can build soil organic matter in these systems and sequester carbon simply by focusing on plant health. So our emphasis, our focus should not be on building soil health, but instead on increasing plant health because healthy plants are the engine that create healthy soil. And I mean, this is going to go against quite a few people in the regenerative agriculture space, including me, that always says, focus on the soil, focus on the soil. But it's, you're right, the plants and the trees create the soil. What does it mean for soilless growing in greenhouses, hydroponics, etc.? Well, the challenge with growing in hydroponics is that in most cases, in many cases at least, the biology that is needed to support plant health is absent in the root system. So I put together a diagram called the plant health pyramid that we use to describe for growers how we observe the evolution of plant health at different stages, different physiological processes, how they become resistant to different types of, and groups of diseases and insects. And what we've observed is that the first two levels of the plant health pyramid, level one and level two, where there's complete photosynthesis and complete protein synthesis, 
these first two levels can be achieved simply by balancing plant chemistry and by balancing plant nutrition. So those first two levels can be achieved hydroponically. The upper two levels of the plant health pyramid, where plants begin producing much higher concentrations and much higher levels of plant secondary metabolites and all of these aromatic compounds that form the foundation of us being able to have a conversation about food as medicine, these compounds are only formed in higher levels when plants have an abundant microbial community in the root system and in the rhizosphere, which precludes most hydroponic operations. So if we really want to have a conversation about producing healthy food, that plants that are resistant to disease, all diseases and all insects and achieving the upper levels of the plant health pyramid, that is generally quite unlikely to happen in a hydroponic system. And my final question, it's now June 2019. If we recall in a year from now, what would you like to look back at that you have accomplished? What would we be discussing? What's the main, I wouldn't say the main projects or the main themes, but what would you like to look back at in a year from now? Well. Successful launch of your product, obviously. Yeah, there's a number of products in the pipeline all the time. I would say that um, advancing eco-agriculture as an engine, as a business, will scale and grow very rapidly in the next year. We have been growing very rapidly for the last number of years, but uh, we're we are at a threshold where we expect that to really accelerate and we begin the hockey stick growth curve that uh, you can think of over the course of the next few months. So that is really exciting. And uh, I'm also in the process of writing a book. It's my desire to have that completed in the next four to five months. It's a very ambitious goal. We'll see if we get it accomplished or not, but uh, hope to have that published by early next year as well. Sounds like a busy year. I want to thank you so much, John, for your time this morning and uh, for sharing. I'll definitely be, be checking in. Thank you, Kuhn. Thanks for the connection. I've been uh, delighted to be here and uh, I love what we do. We're having a lot of fun and uh, we enjoy collaborating with other people who are also having a lot of fun. So anyone is free to reach out to me and connect to me on social media uh, or elsewhere. Happy to connect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kuhn. Bye. I hope you learned something about plant health and what growers and farmers can do to become much more profitable and regenerative. And maybe, maybe we even get to food as medicine. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, Share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc, etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, 
Um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, and what kind of co-investors you could find, or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design, and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking, click on the link below, sign up and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.